Good morning. My name is Dr. Arun Upneja, Dean of the School of Hospitality Administration at Boston University, or Shaw, as we like to call ourselves. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of Shaw, a warm welcome to everyone attending the fifth in our distinguished speaker series of 2021. Before I introduce our guest, please know that we welcome your questions during today's session. Please type them directly into the chat box directed to Professor Lyra Lance, and if time allows, we will be happy to ask them to our guest on your behalf. Also join us next Friday, April 16th, to hear Dilip Perigara, former CEO of Access Point Financial, on navigating hospitality financing in a rapidly changing market. It's the finale of our spring season of Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. While we'll resume the series in the fall, you don't want to miss the last one. Today's topic is hospitality's new frontier, senior living with our guest, someone whom you don't know yet, but you certainly want to get to know, Catherine Sweeney, co-founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of Blue Moon Capital Partners. It's a Boston firm focusing on investments in senior living. Kathy is responsible for setting and directing her firm's investment strategies, including taking the lead on acquisitions and portfolio management and setting return optimization strategies. She's also jointly responsible with Susan Barlow for setting the long-term strategic direction of Blue Moon. She has been an active investment advisor and manager in senior housing industry since 1997. As BU alumna, being immersed in this industry, Kathy was happy to hear that Shaw has developed senior living as a new concentration in our MMH program. Now, there are many reasons why we added this concentration. The economic arguments are compelling. As we will hear from our guest a little later, the senior living industry is valued at about 475 billion and comprises about 24,500 investment grade properties, including 3.1 million units. AHLA says there are 5 million hotel rooms. So that's a good comparison. The number of seniors wanting space in these communities is set to rise. Technology, healthcare, reform, changing tastes and preferences, and demographics have led to a dynamic and evolving industry. COVID-19 pandemic has further accelerated changes in this sector as safety concerns are shaping architecture and engineering design, staffing uh, requirements, pretty much every aspect of our industry is subject to change. Our classes in the Master of Management in Hospitality, concentration in senior living, includes courses covering all the operational aspects of the business, a course in the business of senior housing, and a course that monitors the resident experience. We have other electives from BU School of Social Work and School of Public Health, which provide a different perspective about the discipline. We also have complementary electives in real estate and feasibility. We welcome those interested and with a passion for paying it forward and taking care of our seniors in society. To apply now for this fall, scholarships are also available. Senior living, more than a place to live. It's about how we live. Living our best lives doesn't have to stop when we age. That is what Shaw is all about. Learning to apply best business practices to create meaningful, enriching, and memorable experiences and to build a more hospitable world. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us to talk about one of the fastest growing sectors of our industry, senior living. My pleasure. Thank you, Arun. So let's uh, start. Let's get to know you a little bit and your background. So what did you study at BU and how did you find your way into senior housing? Oh, okay. So ancient times. So what did I study? Um, I studied, my degree was in economics um, and I blended economics with finance. So I, um, I, I've told some folks that I, I'm a graduate of the Metropolitan College which at BU, which um, is a night school program. 
And so I was working during the day. And fortunately, I was working in this small startup organization called the Boston Company Real Estate Council. It has gone on to be merged into larger companies over the years. And um, I very I was there as an administrative assistant, loved what I saw was happening, loved what I was reading, loved what I was typing, um, and decided that I wanted to, uh, and it was not in senior housing, it was in real estate finance, decided I, I wanted to make that my career, but of course needed an undergraduate degree to do so. And BU had a terrific program. Um, via the Metropolitan College. Cannot say enough great things about it. I had fantastic professors and um, just a real solid education, so. Fantastic. And so um, that, that's a that's, uh, very inspirational story how you um, went to college while you were working full time and uh, thanks for the shout out to BU as well. Um, so how did you from there move into senior housing? Yes, that was the other part of your question. So, um, you know, life is never a straight shot, right? So I had been working in commercial real estate investment, investing pension fund money in all kinds of shopping centers, industrial buildings, office buildings, apartment buildings, the whole nine yards. And then I, through a series of mergers, I ended up at a company called AEW Capital Management. They're here in the Seaport District in Boston. And um, they were about to close on their first senior housing investment. Their research department had identified through demographics, and this was in 1997, had identified that the demographic growth was coming. It was nearly here. And um, all these seniors were going to need places to live and let's make investments there. So we committed $25 million to a startup assisted living company in, that was just starting up in Boston called Benchmark Assisted Living. And all it was was the founder, Tom Grape, and a business plan, and then our 25 million of capital. And so the company realized that after the closing of this investment, someone was going to, in the organization was going to need to follow this sector um, asset manage this investment to make sure it would perform and also see if there were other benchmarks out there in the country that we could support um, and really go to school on the business. So I, I, I'll tell you this, the, the, the medium term story, not the long term story, but I said no three times. And one of the reasons I said no was because, you know, who who, want, who wanted to do senior housing? That wasn't sexy, that wasn't glamorous, that wasn't fun, you know, I didn't deem it as fun. But I had had a grandmother who had passed away in just a few years prior, who passed away in a um, Medicaid nursing home. And it was a very undignified experience. And um, I had that nursing home vision in my head that that's what assisted living was. But the folks at the office kept saying, no, it's not that, it's this new product. So I said, look, I'm gonna go do my due diligence. There are a few signs near where I live out in the Metro West section of Boston. I'm gonna go visit them. And what I didn't realize, I went in as an adult daughter decision maker. I used my mother-in-law's sort of, you know, circumstances as my story. And I was blown away. It was, just the complete opposite of that nursing home experience that I had seen my grandmother um, uh, experience in the last uh, months of her life. The residents were, um, they were engaged. They, they might have, there might have been wheelchairs and walkers, but they were in their finest jewelry. They were dressed up. They were shouting across the hall to their friends, come to join for, for lunch or dinner. Um, they were engaged in activities. One of the places was an independent living and had a pool and they were doing aqua aerobics. And I just thought, this is great. If, if my grandmother had still been alive, this would have been a great place for her. And so I felt like I could, you know, I of course then went back to the office, said, yes, I will do this and felt like I really could um, spend my professional years making more of these types of, of communities available for other family members. Thank you. That, that was great. And there's just so much to unpack in what you said, the glamour part of it and, and the hospitality part of it. And, and so we're going to get to all of these, but 
I want to just still continue with the past a little bit. And so your company is called Blue Moon Capital Partners and you are the co-founder. So I assume you had something to, to sort of, you know, have an influence on the name. So yes. how did the name come about? And can you tell us what does Blue Moon Capital Partners do? Sure. So the name um, came from the fact that um, a blue moon is a rare and unique event. A blue moon is two full moons in a calendar month or two full moons in a calendar season. And that doesn't happen very often. And so neither does a completely 100% women owned business in the finance world. Um, and particularly in the real estate segment of the finance world. That's about the last bastion of the old boy network out there. So Susan I, and I have uh, single-handedly <laughs> changed that dynamic. And um, uh, so, you know, a woman-owned business and we are exclusively focused on senior housing. So there is no other company in the country that does what we do and is owned by, by women. Um, what, what we do is we are a private equity firm that invests via joint venture structures with senior housing operators. And we'll do that to build new communities, to buy existing communities. Sometimes the communities we buy are underperforming and we change operator to make them perform better, um, all in service of generating very attractive risk adjusted returns for our investors who are nearly 100% pension funds, um, a, a couple of other um, investors in there as well, but mostly pension fund institutional capital. So thank you for saying that women own, particularly in the real estate. And I think at, at Shaw, we are very, very concerned with that. And so we have a real estate concentration at our undergraduate and our graduate. And, and we are trying to do our part to encourage more uh, women to join this, this industry. Um, so um, going back to what you said, so you're investing, but you're not running them. So you hire asset managers or you hire operators to, to sort of run these, um, these communities. And so you're just investing in them, okay? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about um, the demographics of this industry. Um, these seniors, what does it mean to be a senior? What, are, what is the age range that they have? What are the abilities, interest, and you know, what do they want at this age? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's, you know, COVID has, COVID has had an impact on that around. So let me just broadly say that very much you, all, of, all of the Shaw um, uh, students are very aware that there is a great level of uh, um, product differentiated differentiation in the hospitality world. And that is the same in senior housing. So one size does not fit all. So Arun, to your question in terms of, you know, what does it mean to be a senior and then the housing option to meet that interest. Um, a senior is generally defined as anyone 65 and older, um, but the closer I get to that, the, 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 the more I think it's really 80. <laughs> um, I will say in the heavier care end of the spectrum, which tends to be assisted living and memory care, that the age is around that 80, you know, young 80 year old range. There's another end of the, end of the spectrum that comes before that, which is independent living. And that's really, think of that as almost like age restricted housing. It's an, a full apartment for, um, someone who has to be over 65 and um, they'll have a kitchen and the whole nine yards, but they'll also be communal um, dining facilities in, you know, in, in the lobby, just like a hotel. Um, there'll be <clears throat> often a, a theater room, um, multi-purpose rooms, lots of activity and engagement spaces also on the ground floor. Um, those, those people, they could be in their early eighties, just, maybe less frail, um, but they could also be in their 70s. So there's, there, what does it mean to be a senior is sort of different for everybody. Um, you know, the, the legal definition being above 65, but the actual definition for every individual is, is sort of different. What I will say is the people who go into independent living in their 70s are probably have had some sort of motivating 
thing that's happened in their life. And what we tend to see is, you know, of a, a married couple, one of them is starting to struggle with some health issues, that the other one is having some challenges um, supporting on their own in the home. So they'll move to an independent living community to get cooking support and have engagement, social activities right there in the building. They can still bring, you know, have their car and go out and about whenever they want. That's the purpose of independence. Um, but at least they're living in a multifamily environment that has a little bit more support for them and services for them. And, and, and then we can go on, but I'll stop there and see what other questions you have. You're on mute. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> no, that was great. And I think there is a lot of um, uh, confusion among, you know, at least even I was confused when I started looking into this issue when we started to offer the, um, there is a, so there is a continuum and I don't think that everyone truly appreciates. So uh, you said independent living, um, you can have your car and you're pretty much independent. You just need some assistance. So where do they go from there? What's the next stage and what's the next step? So if you can define that, I think everyone will get educated on that issue. Sure. Sure. So if you think about sort of the funnel, if you will, or the progression, independent living is the most independent and most like an apartment um, with a little bit of hospitality thrown in. <clears throat> and then the next level that you would go to would be assisted living. And that you, there you would go because now you're starting to have some personal care needs. You're having trouble, you know, you might have arthritis, you might have other medical conditions that are making it difficult for you to walk, making it difficult to, dress, to get dressed every day. Um, you might have some mild cognitive challenges, not memory care full on, but some mild. Um, you might have, you know, some heart conditions. You might need supplemental oxygen to carry with you. Those kinds of personal care that start to blend into a little bit of med medical care, but not all the way to needing skilled nursing. Um, and then that environment, assisted living, what you're going to see, the rooms will be smaller <clears throat> because the common areas are much larger. And because now in assisted living, you need to have three meals a day in the dining room. You can still eat in your room if you want. There's, they'll have little mini kitchens. So a smaller fridge, maybe call it an apartment size fridge. Um, oftentimes not a cooktop, but sometimes I've seen sort of a one, one, you know, one ring of a cooktop, um, a microwave, a sink, of course, if you wanted to make yourself something quick, but you're paying, your rent includes three meals a day. Um, also more common area spaces because you're probably not getting out and about on your own. You're probably not driving anymore. You might be, but probably not. Um, there'll be a van for the community to take you and your fellow residents out for activities and outings and things of that nature. Um, but the, the, the operator at that point has a care plan for every resident and they they sort of make rounds every day and making sure that Mrs. Smith, Mr. Jones are, you know, being overseen with whatever challenges they happen to have. And then from there, you would go to memory care if you did develop um, um, dementia related diseases. And oftentimes we talk about Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's is only one form of dementia. Um, there, of course, the rooms are much smaller and the common area is bigger because the operator is going to want you to be out and about in the common areas so they can engage you, they can help you with your disease. Um, they want to make sure that you have safe and secure outdoor space and you can't, um, what's called elope in, in this business, in my business now, elopement doesn't mean what it meant when I was in my twenties. <laughs> elopement means that you're going to escape from the community, which is, um, a better word than escape, but um, it, it really means that the the disease of dementia does um, you know unfortunate things to people's brains and behaviors. And one of the things um, can be that you have this overwhelming urge to get away from whatever environment you are, um, even if it's your own your own home. And then from there, you would go to a skilled nursing facility, and you may also have some um, hospital 
you know, needs, even while you're in the whole spectrum. Thank you for that uh, detailed introduction. So I want to focus in on the fact that you are um, investing mostly in independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Yep. So you are not ventured into the skilled nursing care. Yep. So <clears throat> all of this talk about medical needs, and I think that uh, to some extent is, you know, reminiscent of what you spoke at the beginning of the nursing, uh, nursing care. So uh, let's talk about the seniors of today. What are they looking for in terms of dining, in terms of culture, in terms of social engagement and leading productive and enriching lives? So how has that changed over the years that you've been in the industry? It's a really good question. And we're in the, we're in the process of discerning that right now relative to COVID, right? So what I will say about back you know, 24 years ago when I first started getting into this, um, the seniors were more active. They were less frail. Um, and so, you know, if you recall what I said, how, you know, I went on in my due diligence tour and saw all this activity, that was the senior housing of 24 years ago. Um, there's this, uh, there's sort of a saying we have in senior housing, which is the um, assisted, li the, the independent living resident today was yesterday's assisted living resident. And, you know, sort of the skilled nursing of yesterday is today's assisted living resident. So people tend to want to be in the setting that um, threatens them the less, the least. So, you know, maybe being in a small, maybe having assisted living needs and being in a small apartment and having your three meals, maybe you really don't identify with that. And really what you want to identify with are the, the hip crowd over in the independent living side. And so you, that's where you may, you know, pursue when you're meeting with, you know, the marketing people and so forth to evaluate a community. Um, so as a result, it's almost been like a self-fulfilling prophecy that that way then independent has been housed more with people who have more, more needs. The other aspect of it is you may have moved into independent living in a more spry, um, you know, footloose and fancy free, um, basis, but then you've aged it, you're there for five or 10 years and you've aged in place. And so... Um, you know, that's, that, that changes the profile of the community. And I think unlike hotels, you know, we've talked about this, that in a hotel, you come, you stay a few days, you leave, maybe it's a week, but you leave. In this industry, you don't really leave. And so you age in place. Um, and that can be a wonderful thing because you're, you're making friends and new social connections and getting to know the staff and developing real relationships with people, unlike hotels. Um, but on the other hand, you know, life is, we are not, all not going to live forever and life takes its um, toll on us and um, we age in place. And, and then we may need to move to other segments. Right, you're absolutely right. And I think there's so, again, so many things to unpack. But one thing um, that is very clear to me is that um, more and more people are, you know, sort of pushing at what stage they, they need, what kind of care. And I think people's lifespans are getting longer and our expectations yes. are rising as to what we want. So in terms of infrastructure that you've seen over the, the few years, um, what is, the senior independent living, um, someone who goes into independent living, what kind of infrastructure are they assuming? Do they want swimming pools? Do they want jacuzzi? Do they want a workout place? What kind of food do they want? Has there, has there been any change in that? Oh, definitely, absolutely. Um, from when it started to where it is today, a much more demanding customer. And one thing to keep in mind too is in independent living, the customer is typically the resident themselves, but as you move on to assisted and memory care, the customer becomes um, not the resident so much, but the adult 
the adult children who might even be pro providing some financial support um, to mom or dad living there. Clearly in memory care, the, the customer, the resident needs all the care, but who you're communicating with and interfacing with are the family members. So a much more discerning, um, demanding customer, even going back 24 years ago, myself, I didn't know what assisted living was. And a lot of people didn't know what assisted living was. So in the early years, it was educating them on what it is. Fast forward to today, and I can barely have any meeting with anybody where senior housing is discussed and not have someone at my table or in my discussion know what's what assist outside of my business, what assisted living or you know the whole senior housing business is all about. So it's very well known and that has come with it a much higher um, level of expectations. So, and again, I see a question in the chat as well. Um, so as hospitality graduates and hospitality executives migrate to senior living, how can they contribute to this environment if the focus is so much on uh, medical and the social worker and so forth? So. Um, I, I think people are getting the impression that, in, particularly in the independent living, that it's all medical care and it's all social work care. So can you sort of shed some light on that? Yeah, that's, let's debunk that. It is not. All, it's not all care. Um, it, it, obviously, care is happening inside the building, but that care is typically being coordinated, provided by nurses who are employed by the community. Um, other areas that um, Shaw students can consider both, you know, especially breaking into senior housing, um, internships and, you know, testing it out and that sort of thing. Well, first of all, we absolutely need more talent in this business. The growing number of seniors in this country is astounding and far exceeds any other demographic out there. And th the business is poised for incredible growth. And that is, I am, I'm so pleased to hear that you've taken this on um, because it has hospitality elements to it. Um, and it, it, you know, blended in its housing, its hospitality and its, its healthcare. And the healthcare piece is, does tend to be the scariest piece. I mean, I know for myself as well, it was sort of that, that's where the non-glamor part of it came from was, was you know, ooh, icky healthcare. But um, the more you, you, you are not doing those services because nurses on site need to be doing those services and trained caregivers need to, to do those services. Other areas of a community and a corporate office um, would be things like um, the, the activities. And I don't even like to, the activities used to be things like, you know, painting and doing cut shape cutouts. And I kind of consider that a little bit kindergarten. Um, although some of the art has been amazing and some of the uh, art that the memory care residents do would amaze you. It, this incredible parts of their minds that are still active and it's really inspiring to see their product. But um, today, what again, to um, deal with the more discerning customer, we think of activities more in terms of life enrichment. And what a cool thing, right? What, what can you as a, let's say, head of life enrichment or even an intern in life enrichment, think about to help the senior in this phase of their life get the most out of these years in their life. How amazing is that? Um, you, you, you could be helping them um, create legacy in their families, um, maybe storytelling, maybe their families have never been curious about their backgrounds, but you could be the story you know, writer and, and interview them and come up with a, a, you know, a little book about who they are that could then be passed on to their family members after, after they're gone. And, you know, and just all, and, and seniors still have interests. Seniors are still very engaged politically, um, culturally, charitably, all those kinds of things. So to help be a catalyst to, to help them continue to have impact in areas of interest for them 
um, I think is amazing. And then we've got the whole food component. So dining, I mean, imagine being at the you know last decades of your life and having crappy food. Who? <laughs> Why would you come? You. We have to elevate the food because you know our biggest competitor is the senior staying at home. So to be able to um, put on and and in, in an independent living, they're usually getting one meal a day because they're more independent. Sometimes only twenty meals a month. Um, in assisted living, it's a regulated part. In memory care, you have to provide three meals a day and snacks. And so to make that an amazing experience every day, that's a challenge. But, um, you know, we've all seen some lately, some pictures of some of, now I'm following some of my operators on Instagram and they're posting their dinners and it's gorgeous and it looks delicious and I see full dining rooms. So, um, you know, the food part. And then the last part I'll talk about is marketing. The senior living industry has been slow to adopt digital marketing. And you guys all know that's where it's at. And they have a big catching up to do. And um, having a young um, person coming into an organization, um, a lot of the marketing is done at the corporate office and then pushed to the field. So ha having young people in the corporate office with, with who are much more um, you know, sort of digital media savvy um, would be, um, a, a, you know, a, a very positive, um, welcome addition. So, um, I was speaking to, um, to another, um, companies and I'm trying to follow them on Instagram. And I think Leora has put the, the Sterling chefs on, um, and their food is, it rivals top notch restaurants. So it's just amazing what kind of food, particularly the, the luxury side of, of the senior care, the, independent living is, is yeah. putting out. So, so one can just imagine that if that's the kind of food they're expecting and being provided for all aspects are upgraded. Um, so I just want to return back to a little bit about the social mission that you talked about. Um, and I think that has a lot of resonance with the students that are entering our school and our industry as well. They, they are here because they just don't want to go into business. They are in relationship business. They want to have meaningful interactions with people. And I was very happy to hear you say that um, the residents here are long-term customers, so you can actually develop meaningful relationships with them rather than the transactional, you are here for a day or two and then you leave. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I see as the biggest differentiator between hospitality and senior housing in that in the hospitality business, your customer interactions are transactions. You know, you have a service, you are the GM or head of dining, and you have to please that customer, but then they're gonna leave. In this business, in senior housing, it's really about relationships. And you are having a relationship. And it's a relationship with the customer and then, as I said, you know, at, at the higher levels of care, it's a relationship with the family members. So having a relationship with sons and daughters and grandchildren and the resident, and what that allows you to do is to get to know someone. You know, you, you don't just have a relationship, you have a relationship to get to know someone. And so, you know, having a sit down over tea or whatever the, beverage of choices. They also have alcohol at that piece. You could have a martini with Mr. Jones or tea with Mrs. Smith or, or the opposite. And really like get them talking and learn about them, their families, their histories, interview them. Like you're interviewing me and you've interviewed all these, you know, distinguished speakers, you know, where were you born? Where did you go to school? How did you raise your family? What was it like not to have television, you know, back in the days of radio? What was it like, you know, how did you adapt to all these changes that were happening in the country, whether it was, you know, Vietnam, well, of course, you know, World War II, Vietnam, you know, ass assassinations of presidents. I mean, the turmoil that they have seen gives them incredible perspective too over the turmoil we feel we're experiencing right now in our culture. Um, and so ha having that opportunity and then from that relationship, 
pulling out nuggets of where, where their interests are and whether they, whether there's something you can pull together to amplify that interest or satisfy that interest. I'll give you one anecdote, which I absolutely love. And that is there's an operator in Chicago who had a group of residents in an assisted living and they had never been camping and they always wanted to experience it. And these are people who were in walkers and wheelchairs and had some supplemental oxygen and that operator arranged a camping trip and they went camping. And, you know, with all the logistics that they needed, they, you know, needed to have an ambulance nearby and, you know, the, the tents needed to not be so low to the ground, you know, lots of adjustments that needed to be made, but those people got to go camping and they had never, you know, sit by a fire, roast a marshmallow, sing camp songs, cook on the fire. They got to experience that. So that's that's very interesting, Kathy. I have um, one other question that I want to ask you uh, about financing and investing. A lot of the time when, I, when I've been speaking to people and I look at the facilities, the costs are on the higher side and these are luxury properties. And so my question is, are there opportunities below luxury level um, th that are plentiful or are somehow this is still a, this is a saturated market? And, and the other question, sorry, on, on this issue is, do you see this as a growing industry or a mature industry? Because a lot of career options depend on what kind of industry you're entering. Yeah, so first on the price point and, and, and then on where we are in the cycle. Um, price point wise, you're absolutely right. It is, um, it is a luxury. That being said, the, um, there, there are different parts of the country where there are more, I would call moderate, not, not necessarily affordable, um, but more moderate. And they tend to be in tertiary markets where land was less expensive, where labor is less expensive and those kinds of you know, contributing factors. Um, so maybe say they're 20 or 30% below the luxury. To, to truly serve um, all the people who want assisted living, um, we need to have, we, we call it, you know, a middle market product in greater scale, and we need an affordable product. And it is, it's something that, I, you know, Beth Mace of NIC, who um, Leora knows, it has been spending, it's almost like a labor of love for her. To, her there are a few experiments out there. And it, as we know, all transformation does start with some experimentation. Um, so I, I, I think it will come, but that too is something that new, new talent coming into the industry can really look at the industry <clears throat> in a different way <clears throat> and bring those ideas to the table to say, and maybe there are some corollaries of budget hotels and motels that could be brought to bear in the senior space that those in the senior world just don't see. So there's a lot of opportunity for kind of cross pollinization of ideas and best practices and, and um, transformations. In terms of where, um, where senior housing is in its, in its cycle, um, think back to the 24 years ago when I got into this, it was absolute infancy. And when you go from infant on up, it, it's hard. It's a heavy, heavy lift. Um, and we trudge through it. And today, what I would say is it's an industry in its teenage years. And it's teenage for a couple of reasons. One, that that 80 year demographic is hitting in five, five years from now. And this is the time period that we have to, just like a teenager has to get ready for adulthood, we have to get ready to meet that. And we've got five years left. So COVID um, was a disruptor in a good, in a, in a, in a bad way that is obvious and in a good way that might not be so obvious. And that is COVID is forcing, it was such a disruptor. It is forcing everybody to rethink how to get ready for five years out because we've got to serve the customer today and, 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 and learning all the, the wants and desires. It's no surprise that you know, when COVID first hit in this country, it was in those congregate settings like the nursing home, which does tend to have double occupancy, um, where there was the breakout. 
well, that just rippled down to senior housing as not being safe. So our whole mantra in this whole year is safety. So air filtration systems being um, implemented in, in, into our communities, um, touchless features, um, you know, all, all kinds of um, other practices that we can put into place to ensure ample PPE, frequent testing. Of course, 96% of our residents now are vaccinated. Um, and about 68% of the staff are vaccinated. So we're almost some of the safest places you could be. If you wanna have dinner with your grandmother, if they live in one, you should go. And you, you know, probably don't have to wear a mask. So um, anyway, uh, so it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity. We are, the, the business is desperate for talent. I mean, I, I, I may have said that already, but I'll say it a couple more times before the end. We need talent. Um, being at a corporate office starting, and obviously it's gonna be a junior level to start, um, but there's a development aspect, the marketing, the dining, the HR, um, you know, and, and when you're looking at places to go in finance, when you're looking at places to go, looking at companies that have a very good um, professional development um, program track record, um, you know, um, process is obviously um, would be good. So, Kathy, um, I think one of the and and we've discussed this in the past, but one of the you know uh, interesting things about trying to when you're looking at a new career is whether the industry is in a growth mode, and you're saying there are more seniors entering five years from now the baby boomers, you know, the first of the baby boomers will hit the market. So do you expect to see a dramatic increase over the next five, 10 years in the um, senior care housing at all levels, luxury, below luxury, affordable, and so forth, that anyone, any student wanting to go into the market now can see, you know, huge prospects for, for growth in pretty much any aspect of the business they want to be in? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of statistics, um, just to back that up. Um, between 2020 and 2025, so right now, the senior housing industry needs to be building 53,000 units of new senior housing among all of those, you know, um, sort of call it brands, if you will, or stratification um, in the country. So how many did they build last year? Less than 10,000. So, you know, we, because of COVID, because nothing could get financed. And I can tell you because I'm trying to build now in a couple of markets and financing is very constrained right now at good terms. So that, that I've seen this before. This is like my third cycle. So that'll, that'll repair and it will probably be 2022 by the time the banks catch on that, you know, they need to step it up um, on, on good terms. And, um, but, but that just goes to show you how um, the demand and the supply will already not be met today. And that's just exacerbating between here and, you know, five years from now. So I said 53,000 in the next units in the next five years, you know, 20, 20, 25. It goes to 96,000 units a year the neck the following five years. So from 2026 to 2030, 96,000, nearly twice what it is right now. So we have a huge need. Now, of course, those 96,000, the 53,000, like I said, they're not all luxury, um, you know, customers, but, you know, a great opportunity to be looking at all of the stratification of the product and like I said, there are some experiments going on and there'll be more experiments going on. And it's something Blue Moon is um, you know, evaluating as well. Our, our investors tend to want um, the highest returns in, in the land. <laughs> so it's hard for us to do that at the moderate price point, but there are some new investment strategies that we are considering and talking to our investors about to um, be able to maybe get a, a, a bit of a lower return, but but do good. So you know, do well by doing good. 
um, is, is something that we're having conversations about. So Kathy, I want to go back. I think at the beginning you mentioned um, opportunities in uh, digital marketing and asset management. So I just want to talk more about what are these opportunities that are available. So you've got this industry is kind of sort of like the hotel industry where there are big operators, then there are franchised operators. Um, and so, and there are opportunities in asset management. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. What are the different opportunities that are available to students that are entering the market today? Yeah, so um, on, on, the, on the marketing front, um, I see a lot of old ide ideas. Well, 24 years ago, the marketing was in the yellow pages and you guys probably don't even know what yellow pages are anymore. Um, so there have been improvements. Um, today, it's mostly on the website, um, maybe some print advertising. I've see, I'm seeing radio and TV being tried. But, you know, seniors are on Facebook, they are on Instagram, um, and, you know, and, and not only that, but key stakeholders are on these platforms. And so understanding the holistic brand and how to promote that brand and how to generate leads for the community is something that is that the old and tired ways of doing that are, are, not, are not resulting in the same impact that we need it to. And, and you know, everybody knows, I mean, you know, people are becoming famous only on Instagram, you know? And so to be able to have a, a platform that gets across your brand and all the all that great stuff that you want your brand to convey, which is mostly feeling. You want to have your brand establish and know how that fe your brand feels and makes you feel. You can't do that on TV, radio, print without also being in digital. And um, just real, real opportunity for some improvements um, there. In terms of asset management, um, so asset management can be at a, a lending institution, an equity institution, I'm equity. Um, and it, you know, in, in the debt world, it's usually managing loans, um, which is a little more green eye shade and looking at numbers every month or quarter and making sure that they, you know, meet expectations on, and you might actually have to go out and visit the communities um, one, once a year, twice a year. And on the equity side, I, what I say is we're in the first loss position. So if a property struggles, our capital is at risk before the lender's capital is at risk. So being in that first loss position, I, we have a much more heightened um, uh, interaction with our operators. So we're getting things like weekly flash reports. That's all the sales and marketing information. We're getting monthly profit and loss statements and anything else that we need. And we're, we're slicing, dicing, dissecting all of that. And we've got tools that our team here has built that then rolls it all up at a big level and says, okay, across our whole portfolio, we have 30 assets now. $2 billion of assets under management, how do we manage that? Um, all of our asset managers came from operators. So they have that insight into how um, these communities should be run. And then when they get the data and they, they roll it all up, then we stare every week, the whole team stare, sits in a room, well now on a Zoom, and walks through all the data of every single property. And we say, we need to work with the operator on generating more leads. So we have to work with the operator on closing more of the leads, doing more tours. Um, customer satisfaction grades are low. Um, we're spending too much money on, you know, something, you know, uh, overtime labor. That's a big, a big thing. The caregiver labor is very sparse right now. So spending too much money on overtime. So really then having the monthly calls with the operators to walk through what they're doing to fix um, those um, underperforming areas or optimize areas that they're doing really well at. Um, 
and then visiting the properties as well. Does all that answer this your sounds, question? Oh, absolutely. I think all of this sounds very familiar and this is what we teach and this is what our students um, enjoy doing. So um, all of this sounds, particularly when we were talking the luxury sector and all the amenities and all the food, sounded very exciting. I'm far from being in my 80s and needing, but do you think I should go book a space in one of your luxury properties now? <laughs> um, you wouldn't fit in. <laughs> You're too young. Um, you can go tour. Um, you can go tour, but you would not enjoy, you would not enjoy it at this level. Um, but you would, you would enjoy working there. If, is that what you meant or as a resident? I was going to book a space, but I'll wait, hold on for a few more years before. Yeah, I, I would hold on for a few more years a room. Yeah, the Zoom, Thanks. the Zoom is making you very young. So you've got quite, quite a number of years. Thank you. There you have it, folks, straight from one of the premier experts in the nation. It's a growing industry, attractive career options in operations, investments, and asset management. Enter the industry when it is still young. Ride the boom as more seniors flood the market looking for luxury senior care communities. Thank you, Kathy. I enjoyed listening to you and learning. Thank you for spending some time with our students and young professionals who are listening. And thank you also for doing a very important job in our society, creating communities for senior citizens. Thank you. I'm now going to turn you over to my colleague, Professor Leora Lanz, who's going to ask you a different set of questions. Also, we have been getting some questions on the chat. So she's going to ask you those. Okay. Professor Lanz, take it away. Thank you, Dean Abnasia. Hi, Kathy. Hello. We do hi, we do have a number of questions that kept coming in, business related. So as much as I know we all want to get to know you a little bit better personally, I still want to ask some of these questions on behalf of the folks who are listening today. Uh, you just did talk about some of the nuances of financing. And as Dean Ibnaja also reiterated, we did hear so many parallels to the operations of lodging that can translate over into the senior living or seniors housing industry. This question came in from one of our alums wanting to know, in looking back at the last few years, and perhaps of course with this last year in particular, are your investment strategies changing at all going forward in this niche? Excellent question. Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, and I would say yes and no. And the yes is where we used to be very centric on a market and an operator and the product, right? We have sort of three screens, people, product, market when we would be making an investment decision, be it to buy a new property, to build a new property or buy an existing. We focused on the people, but it, slightly more than the other two criteria. Fast forward to today, and I would tell you, it is certainly market and product are still important, but people are so important. And so important, uh, you know, more than 50% important. I could have a bad product in an okay market with fabulous people and do very well. So um, the strategy, we're still developing, buying, fixing, but um, the criteria of that has skewed much more to people. So is that the team of the operator as well as who is on the community campus or who's in the community dealing with the residents and, and working directly with the residents? Is that what we mean by the people? Exactly. And it's yeah. the home office's support of the field. But at the end of the day, it's the people in the field who are producing your profits. So making sure that they are top notch and that we have some connectivity with them through monthly calls and things like that. Yeah. Um, almost like they report to us. So I also, I'm hearing, this is my interpretation, but the people mean the hospitality as well as the skill set in organization, asset management, finance, marketing, HR, and all the traditional sort of departments that we would also be familiar with in, in the lodging sector. 
Yes. Okay, great, great. One of our grad students actually um, sent a question in and, and we were talking about this, Kathy, the other day. There are so, now some distressed lodging assets and everybody's trying to figure out how do we repurpose it? How do we, you know, what do we do with this real estate? Mm -hmm. Is seniors housing a realistic way to repurpose some of this? It's possible. Um, it's possible. It's not easy. It's not as easy as you would think. Yeah. Um, but it, it has been done um, in the past uh, and, and in the present. I just uh, saw one that uh, opened in New York that had been a former something or other hotel. And it looks, you know, pictures all looks beautiful. It's, it's definitely possible. The aspects of a hotel are usually a very good location, right? A drive-by location. Um, in a market that supports uh, through demographics and incomes and housing prices and things like that. You know, it, it, you know, in hotels, you're probably looking for business and, and uh, tourism, um, but the business aspect definitely supports. In the product part, it can be a little challenging just because you don't want, can you see yourself living in your hotel room all right. the time. Right. <laughs> so the room configuration needs to be changed. And some hotels were built like bunkers. And so, you know, taking down a wall and is a little tricky, but um, it, it's, it's definitely a possibility. It's doable, but there's some cost of construction to keep in mind That's because it's correct. not, it's not an easy replacement. That's There's correct. changes that have to yeah, be made. It's not changing Hilton to right. benchmark senior living and call it right. a day. Exactly. Fair enough. We had somebody in uh, who's listening in today who said he's been in the lodging sector for 20 years now. He's trying to get into seniors housing, but he's concerned, or at least there might be some a little bit of pushback saying, oh, that's a short-term thing. You'll go back to lodging when lodging uh, comes back. How, how, how do you help respond to uh, that? Or what kind of advice a, do you have for that? Yeah, that's a, I've heard that. I have heard that from some of my operators. Um, you know, it really comes down to you personally and conveying the, having a strong, doing research on senior housing, conveying that you've researched senior housing, doesn't hurt to have some kind of personal story as to why senior housing um, might be a fit for you, whether it be an elderly relative, your aging parents, you've had more exposure, you love it from the social standpoint. Um, you, you, you have to do a little bit of selling them that you, you mean business and that this isn't just a, a way station until hospitality recovers. For that person who's asking that question, I know in the short amount of time where I have learned about this sector or I'm starting to learn because I really only sort of tipped the iceberg, passion is really what I hear from everyone in this business. There is a, there's a genuine, authentic passion from yourself, Kathy, from anyone who I've had a chance to interact with who's in this, any aspect of this, this business, from ops to asset management to financing. There's such a passion for wanting to help the residents, which is us eventually, right? It's really a passion for that. So I would just add to this gentleman's question, you know, I think if the passion's truly there, it'll connect with yeah, exactly. what you're talking to. Fair enough. I, you know, as we wrap up, are there any trade associations, Kathy, or organizations? What do you recommend for our students as ways to, to break into this? If this is something we're not familiar with, how do you suggest they start learning, start reading, start digging deep to connect and to network? What would you say? Yeah, I would start with um, the trade associations, which is a good suggestion. So the NIC, which is the National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care, that's a good place to start. Um, another is Argentum, um, that's a trade association in DC. Um, that's a good place to start. Um, once you, um, you could, you could also go on American Seniors Housing Association, which has a sleeve called um, Where You Live Matters. And that's interesting because ASHA, the American Seniors Housing Association, started to recognize that the industry needed to do more about educating the consumer on the advantages of senior living. 
So they created this marketing um, campaign called Where You Live Matters. And that would be interesting to look at from how the industry is promoting all of its positive attributes as a, as a learning piece. Fair enough, fair enough. I think because we're at the 11.30 mark, I'm gonna turn it back to Dean Abnaja, but Kathy, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you for opening our eyes, or at least for most of us who are on this call, opening our eyes to this sector of how we can take our skills and bring it to an industry that needs it and wants it. Um, we really appreciate it. So thank you, Kathy, very much. Thank, and thank you, my pleasure. Dean Abnaja, back to you. Thank you, Professor Lance and Kathy, on behalf of the school, the staff, the students, and everyone listening today. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and educating all of us about what it means to be in this industry, the career options, the investment opportunities. And I do want to remind everyone that we have our last session on Friday, April 16th. So please tune in. We would love to see all of you there. Thank you and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you.